There's a lot that stood out to me in Arco, the brilliantly creative gameplay that forced you to think your way out of these seemingly unfair situations, the masterful sound design that added both feeling and weight to each and every action the player took, and of course the jaw-dropping art that caused you to stop and stare at these stunning scenes laid out before you. I truly love modern games, but there's something I feel we've lost in the pursuit of better graphics and visual fidelity in these near-photorealistic worlds, something we've lost in the ever-increasing need for games to be smooth and easily digestible to ensure that the player is never once confused or asked to think about what to do next, never once needing to wonder about the inherent mysteries of these worlds. Now, just to be clear, I'm not a hater of new games. A lot of my favorite games of all time have come out in the past decade, but when I play games like Arco, I'm reminded of the profound potential this medium has and is so often uninterested in taking advantage of. So with that, I'll ask you a question. When you look at this landscape, what do you see? To those of you who get this game, this type of game, you see the same thing that I do. To those of you who don't, I'm gonna try my best to explain what it is, because maybe in doing so, you'll be able to see it too. Arco is a tactical RPG with gameplay outside of combat being similar to something like Oregon Trail or other old RPGs that had to describe what was happening instead of showing you. Things like walking up to a bush and having the game say, the bush is covered in thorns, will you grab the fruit anyway? You grab the fruit but cut your hand, minus 2 HP, that kind of thing. You play as four different characters, Tizo, an old man who wants revenge, Itze, a young woman who wants revenge, and Afra and Shio, twins who want revenge. Can you guess what this game is about? You play as all of them individually with the exception of the twins who you use together. It's a bit like like Octopath Traveler or Dragon Quest IV where you experience the different stories from characters around the world before they eventually meet up. Throughout the story, you're able to make decisions all the time. Some are minor like that bush example from earlier, but some are more major and will seriously impact the course of the story. For example, Itze at one point has an option that flat out asks you if you want to go to location A or location B. The direction you go will be permanent. This is a point of no return. Furthermore, these choices you make come with a system called guilt. Basically, when you do vile, detestable things that would make most people feel guilty, like theft or leaving an empty container in the fridge and there's clearly no cake left, you'll accumulate guilt. This guilt will cause the ghosts of your past to haunt you. More on that later. Now, obviously, I won't say much more about this story so as to avoid spoilers, but I will say that it has a moment so good that I genuinely believe only three other games I've played have been able to pull off something similar, and one of them honestly might be a stretch. So, since I can't really say much else about the story, this is a lie, I will come back to the story later, we'll jump into what's often my favorite part of most games, the gameplay, and more specifically, the combat. I was worried that the combat in Arco wouldn't be good. Furthermore, I was worried that it would be a bit too complicated, especially considering the devs themselves put out a tutorial on it, suggesting that the one that existed in-game wasn't good enough for some people. This was a rather concerning thought. However, just a few hours in, I was granted a feeling that almost no other game was able to give me. To fully understand this feeling, we need to start from the bottom and dissect each part of this game's combat as they build up to create this one-of-a-kind experience. Beginning with the basics, this is your character and these are the enemies. During your Turn, the game will pause and allow you to map out your actions. You can move, wait, or use a skill. The enemies also have these same three options. When you confirm your action, the turn begins and you watch as the actions of all the units on the battlefield play out. The turn ends and you repeat until the enemy's HP reaches zero or yours does. Now let's rewind a bit and look at the three options, starting with the most simple one. Wait. When you wait, you're effectively skipping your turn to regenerate Magia, which is an extremely valuable resource that you can think of as your action meter or your energy gauge. Basically, it determines what you can do. We'll go more in depth soon. Move is your second option. This is deceptively simple, and it may be the most critical tool in your arsenal. Positioning is vital to your survival in this game. They even say as much at the start. Finally, we reach the point where I can stop saying, we'll talk about this in a second, since practically everything is based around these right here, your skills. Skills can do a plethora of different things and are balanced around the Magia system. Using a skill requires Magia, and some are so powerful that they even have cooldown outside of the Magia system. A large part of your success in this game will come down to your ability to manage and maintain your Magia for the perfect moments. I'm not kidding when I say you could make a strong argument that this resource is more valuable than HP itself. Sure, if your HP hits zero, you lose, but if you're in a position where both your HP and your Magia are at one and zero respectively, and you could only choose to restore one, you'd probably choose Magia nine times out of 10. That may be hard to believe, so to demonstrate, we'll look at what those skills actually do and how they work in practice. So there's almost a rock-paper-scissors style system to this game's combat. It's a bit like the weapon triangle in Fire Emblem, but a lot less strict. 
Here's how it goes. Melee beats range up close, movement beats melee at a medium distance, and range beats movement and melee sometimes. It depends. Look, I said it was a lot less strict. What really matters here is positioning. Melee is far too fast for range up close. It'll always hit first. HP in this game is pretty limited, both yours and your opponents. Equally, the effect that certain skills can have are extremely devastating. Let's look at an example. There are some attacks that can stun whatever unit they hit, preventing them from doing anything until next turn. Now remember, HP is limited, right? So say a character has 5 HP and they get hit by this stun attack that deals 3 damage. Now we can't move and we have to take another hit. Mercifully, that stun attack is likely on cooldown, so we don't have to worry about getting stunned again, but we do have to worry about, well, everything else. If our opponent here has 3 Magia, we probably lose. Here's why. First, we'll take one normal attack that'll deal 1 damage. This won't stun us, but it will bring us down to 1 HP. Now I know what you're thinking, well we're not stunned anymore, so we're safe. Not quite. See, unless we have an attack that can either interrupt or kill in one single hit, or a skill that can quickly get us out of here, we're cooked. There's an attribute to certain skills called Interrupt, which effectively skips the target's turn, but only if they land before the target uses their skill. So if we have an Interrupt here, we can use it to skip the opponent's turn and figure out a solution from there. But if we don't, our only option left is to use an evasive skill to get away. If we lack both of those, or the Magia to use them, we won't survive. Taking things a step further though, even if we do Interrupt this turn, what's our plan next turn? We still can't get away, and we can't just spam Interrupts forever due to the cooldown in Magia. So again, we're probably dead. Now imagine you could choose to restore your Magia or your health here. Which one would you choose? I'd personally go for Magia. If we restore Magia, we'd be able to use our evasive skill or even attack multiple times in a row using an interrupt followed by a high damage attack to potentially defeat the enemy right here and now. If we restored health, we'd run, the enemy would be too close so they'd land another attack to deal some damage, and we'd be in nearly the exact same spot as before, just with one extra Magia since you gain Magia when you move. While this isn't necessarily a purely negative play, Using an evasive move to totally reset the situation at the cost of a bit of Magia is strictly better in my eyes. Now consider the fact that this entire interaction comes from just one single stun attack from one single enemy on one single turn. These calculations and plans are running through your head constantly as the fight goes on. Each and every one of these small interactions could single-handedly determine the winner of the fight. But this barely scratches the surface. These skills don't just stun and interrupt. Their attributes and variety are genuinely insane. There's one skill that allows you to detonate an arrow that didn't hit a target. This explosion will deal 5 damage, stun the enemy, and has absurd range, especially considering it can be used on any arrow on the field. Or what about Swap Teleport? This is an ability that lets you swap places with an enemy, stunning them in the process and repositioning yourself. This doesn't use your turn either, so you could swap, then instantly follow up with an attack. The skills that you have access to are just so overwhelmingly powerful, and the HP is so limited that oftentimes simply being able to act multiple times, reposition, or use your most powerful skills will be more valuable to you than just restoring your HP. However, it's entirely possible that your playstyle will benefit from HP more than Magia. I personally focused on blitzing enemies as fast as I could, but you can really experiment here and create your own strategy. I'll go more in depth on that, but first we need to talk about the enemies since believe it or not, everything I just described is less than half of what makes the combat so special. Part of why all of this works so well is because of the variety of the enemies, not just in their attacks but in their personalities as well. Every single one of them has both a game plan and a skill set to accomplish it. This is the Mad Toad. He's an angry guy and he uses his agility to his advantage. He's got three attacks, jump, shoot tongue, and depending on the variety, bubble shield. Jump is a two-turn attack that causes an AoE wherever the toad lands. Shoot Tongue is an incredibly fast melee attack with solid range that interrupts. Finally, the occasional bubble shield will protect the target from any kind of attack for a few turns. You can avoid the Shoot Tongue attack by running perpendicular to it. The jump requires you to stay out of range, and the bubble shield can either be interrupted before it's cast, or stalled out once it is. Of course, this is going to be character and skill dependent, but when fighting these enemies, I like to be at a close to medium range to take advantage of the opening when they land from their jump while remaining far enough to avoid the tongue attack. This one, on the other hand, is a sniper. In an ideal world, you would never be further than three inches away from this guy, because if you are... Yeah, what he does is pretty self-explanatory. He can only shoot a few times before having to reload, and when he does, that's your chance to go all out. This, however, is what I'd consider the danger zone. If you're far enough away, you'll usually have time to evade his attacks. If you're close, you can interrupt them. But if you're here, you're in trouble. A sniper's danger zone is going to be different from a shovel guy's, and that's going to be different from a gatling gunner. I think you get the idea. Not only do you want to be in a different spot depending on who you're fighting, but that positioning is going to vary depending on your game plan and what tools you have at your disposal. You've really got to be careful.
Oh yeah, I forgot about those. Remember that guilt system from earlier? Well, it'll spawn these special enemies called ghosts, and they temporarily add a new layer to the combat. You see, these ghosts can actually move on your turn, and they gradually creep towards you almost like a mouse to a subscribe button. This forces you to quickly come up with a plan or take damage when they eventually run into you. This system may feel a bit unfair, but it's actually just asking you to make a choice. Do you want to avoid the one damage so badly that you're willing to make a worse plan, or do you want to take the damage and prepare the best plan possible? Maybe you run from a ghost only to find yourself in a terrible position, one so bad that you realize that you probably should have just taken the hit since now you're surrounded with no way out. I really enjoy the ghost system and the extra stress and frantic nature that it can add to the combat. So with that interruption out of the way, and with an understanding of the abilities of the enemies, we can go more in depth on the abilities of the player and how you can craft your own personal units. The skills on your characters are chosen by you and equipped before each battle. You get to build your characters into a few different variations of the same core ideas. Itze, for example, could be a pure tank with skills that focus on regen and defense, a more DPS-focused unit with her jab to boost her damage and hook to interrupt, or a number of <laughs> other different variations. Maybe I've got teleport and I can just jump through the danger zone of a sniper. Maybe I've got some tank abilities that'll let me endure a shot before getting up close. Maybe my character has a sniper rifle too, and they can just shoot right back. The item system then takes this already profound amount of customization and player choice to a totally new level. There are these items that you can use in battle to do a variety of different things. You can throw explosives, use healing items, sacrifice some of your health for magia, the list goes on. However, you only have a few slots for these items depending on, you guessed it, how many slots you gave your character. Once again, the choice is in your hands on how many items you want to be able to use. Maybe you're upgrading Tizo and you thought, none of these skills really stand out to me, but I did just get some cool new items that I'd love to make use of, and so you choose to give him a third item slot instead of a new ability. I could keep going like this for hours, but it all comes down to one central idea. This is the single most important and satisfying part of Arco's combat to me. Your ability to plan and envision a battlefield, the situations you may come across, and how you'll face them make this combat so immensely rewarding. You can imagine a combo in your head as you're unlocking skills and equipping items, then watch that very same combo play out in a real fight. It's not just pre-battle planning though, you'll have these moments where you're in an impossible situation surrounded by projectiles you won't be able to avoid, when suddenly it clicks. I can use swap teleport to get character A to safety and put character B in the storm of projectiles instead. Then I'll use character B's natural teleport ability to get out of harm's way, and in doing so, save both of them. Not only do you feel like a tactical genius in these moments, but you feel a profound sense of pride in your ability to overcome the unfair odds that this game presents you with. You're often outnumbered and literally out outgunned, but you're smarter than them. You're too clever, your plans were just a bit better, and thanks to that, you're able to come out on top every time. This moment right here perfectly encapsulates what makes this game so special. There's this thing that adds to every single aspect of the game, and it's something that, perhaps because they don't have to, most modern games don't really take advantage of anymore. There are so many moments like this throughout the game that just use one line, one sentence, just a few simple words of text, and yet they hold so much weight. This isn't necessarily because of what the text itself is saying, but more because of the context. You'll stand atop a hill overlooking a valley that stretches on forever with the simple line, after a lifetime of waking up to the same view every day, it's cool to see so many new sights on this journey. That's it. It's certainly nothing particularly profound, but this splash of images floods your mind as you read it. You've probably woken up to the same view every day at some point in your life, assuming you don't right now. You know what this is like, how it gradually gets more and more boring, almost as though the setting itself is losing saturation with each passing day. Then you go into a new town or city, and all of a sudden the world itself inexplicably seems more vibrant. But it's not just about the ideas that this one sentence puts into your mind. It also serves to enhance this already stunning scene in front of you. It feels more significant now with the context that this isn't just fresh and awe-inspiring to you, the player, but to the character as well. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a throwaway enemy will say a generic line that you've heard thousands of times in hundreds of games, movies, and shows, and yet here it elicits such a visceral, almost furious response due to the situation surrounding it. Arco is so good at taking this incomplete picture and asking your mind to fill in the rest. This is a trend that flows through the environments as well, not just the rolling hills and vast plains that expand out into the horizon, but the temples and caves too. You'll go down one path and find all this interesting stuff, statues with 
with stories and legends that have long since been forgotten, creatures who have made this dilapidated place home, and seemingly impossible phenomena that you can't begin to explain. But then you go back and see a boulder or a cave -in that's blocking an entire separate path. What could be down there? What kind of mysteries or stories await that you'll never be able to see? There's this overwhelming sense of wonder that permeates through so much of this game, and it's only able to exist not because you have these enormous set pieces or endless caverns that you can explore and plunder for hours. No, this sense of wonder comes from this game's masterful ability to show you something so fascinating and intriguing that you can't help but think of what could have been behind door number two. It creates this feeling that you're only seeing part of the picture and you're being forced to imagine what exists in the rest. Crucially, however, this game does not rely purely on imagination. Plenty of games use pixel art or deliberately vague stories to force you to fill in the blanks and make your own world. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there are games with a budget larger than what most people will make in their lifetime. These games are so focused on giving one specific and perfectly tailored type of experience that there's barely any room left for the player's input, if any at all. You don't have to imagine the details because they already exist. You don't need to envision the expressions on the characters' faces because they're already stunningly realistic. These worlds are created for you, and that's okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but there's just something so meaningful in a world that you helped form. Our gives you this extraordinarily interesting snapshot before your mind fills in the rest. Where so many games would say, here's a canvas, now paint, or here's a work of art, now consume it, this game presents you with an outline of the Mona Lisa and asks you to finish the rest. You can tell there's something special here. It's not a blank slate, nor is it a masterpiece that you had no hand in creating. It's an incomplete work of art that you, using the endless power of your own mind, are able to grant form, meaning, and purpose. This isn't even mentioning the sound design here, which is something that I usually avoid talking about since I'm far from an audio technician, but something about the sound effects and music in this game is just too exceptional to ignore. The slow, quiet strumming of the guitar with these wait, what are those instruments called? Do you see why I don't talk about this stuff? <laughs> Whatever. You just find yourself submerged in your own thoughts as your mind wanders endlessly by itself to places so clearly unknown yet so comfortably familiar. You feel as though you're getting lost in a place you've been your entire life. You're enveloped by this warm, soothing atmosphere that you could easily see yourself spending hours in without a single second going by. Not due to the precise combat or the fluid movement or the grandiose bosses, but because of the ability to get lost while standing completely still.